continuous conflicts, many Americans and analysts have expressed regret over the United States abdicating from Afghanistan following a failed 20-year nation-building effort, stating if only they had known before what they know now, they never would have gone down that path. The response can be summarized in a single word, China, and the fears could be summed up in a few paragraphs. The 40 years between 1979 and 2019 marked an era in relations between the United States and China. Even though there were many ups and downs on the whole, it was an era of constant economic integration between the two countries. The depth of that integration between the United States and China contributed to much deeper globalization of the world economy and helped to maintain four decades of relative peace between the world's two superpowers. And keep in mind that it is great power conflicts that result in enormously destabilizing world wars. During that period of US-China globalization, some manufacturing workers in the United States lost their jobs, while others gained access to vast new export markets. It lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in India, China and East Asia, while also making many products significantly more affordable to a larger number of American consumers. That said, if the current trend continues, there is a good possibility that both countries as well as many others will look back 20 years from now and say that the breakdown in relations between the two countries, US-China, in the early 2020s contributed to the world becoming a more risky and less prosperous place. In the short term, the relative prosperity and peace that the world enjoyed during those 40 years could not be explained without mentioning the US-China bonding. Nevertheless, since 2010, both China and the United States have taken steps towards de-integration and in some cases even towards outright conflict. Among the factors contributing to China's reversal are the country's increasingly bullish leadership style, both domestically and internationally. Its trade policies are based on the principle, if heads we win, tails you lose, and the changing makeup of its economy. That said, if the current trend continues, there is a good possibility that both countries as well as many others will look back 20 years from now and say that the breakdown in relations between the two countries, US and China, in the early 2020s contributed to the world becoming a more risky and less prosperous place. These two colossal countries went from doing a lot of business at the table to kicking each other much harder under the table. That is, with a world that is significantly less capable of managing climate change, cyberspace, biodiversity loss and the emergence of new zones of chaos. Prior to moving from cooperation to confrontation with China, we should examine ourselves and ask ourselves some difficult questions. A similar approach is required by China because we both might really miss this relationship if it were to end one day. The first question to ask is, what features of their competition or conflict with China are unavoidable between a status quo power and a rising power, and what can be dampened by the smart policy? Let us begin with the unavoidable. For roughly the first 30 years of the country's 40-year economic integration, China has sold us what we refer to as thin goods. Shirts that we chose to wear on our backs, tennis shoes that we wore on our feet, and solar panels that we affixed to our roofs. America, on the other hand, sold deep goods to China, softwares and computers which went deep into its system and could only be purchased from them. Today, China is able to produce an increasing number of deep goods, such as Hawaii 5G telecom systems, but they no longer have the shared trust to install its deep technologies in the bedrooms, homes and businesses or even to sell the deepest goods to the world, such as advanced logic chips. They didn't care whether China's government was authoritarian, libertarian or vegetarian when it sold them shallow goods. However, when it comes to purchasing China's deep goods, shared values are important and they are lacking them. On the other hand, there's President Xi Jinping's leadership strategy that has extended the Communist Party's control into each pore of Chinese culture, society and commerce. This has just reversed a trend that has gradually opened China to the rest of the world since the year 1979. You get a much more aggressive China when you combine this with Xi's perseverance that China would never again be dependent on the US for advanced technologies and Beijing's eagerness to do whatever it takes to buy, invent, steal, copy or intimidate in order to ensure that they are always a step ahead has taken China to a completely whole new level. Xi, on the other hand, has overplayed his hand. The level of technology penetration and theft of US institutions has become intolerable, not to mention China's decision to suffocate democracy in Hong Kong to eradicate Uyghur Muslims' culture in Western China and to use its economic power as well as wolf warrior diplomats to frighten neighbors such as Australia from even requesting an investigation into the emergence of the novel coronavirus in Wuhu. 
because of Xi's efforts to turn entire China against the Western world, which will be demonstrated in full when China hosts the 2022 Winter Olympics, both the president and his predecessor have identified countering China as the most important strategic objective for America. But have we really considered how we will go about doing this? Nader Mosavisade, the founder and chief executive officer of Macro Adversary Partners, which is a geopolitical consulting firm, suggests that if we are to shift our attention away from the Middle East towards an irreversible strategy of having to confront China, we should begin by asking three fundamental questions. First and foremost, Mosa Visade asks whether we are certain that we understand the dynamics of a vast and changing society like China very well enough to conclude that its unavoidable mission is the worldwide spread of authoritarianism. What's more, when this will necessitate the United States making a generational adversarial commitment, will this in turn result in an even more nationalistic China? According to Mosa Visade, we have listened as much as we have talked to our European and Asian allies about the actual fact of their political and economic relationships with China, ensuring that their preferences and values are integrated into a common approach, because without it, any coalition will come crashing down. Putting a broad transporter coalition around universal values such as the rule of law, human rights, free trade and basic accounting standards is unquestionably the most effective way for America to counterbalance China. This is precisely what China despises the most. When we frame the confrontation with China as a contest between the presidents of the United States and China, Xi can easily enlist the supporter of all Chinese nationalists on his side. When we make it a contest between the world and China over which international norms are the best, we separate the hardliners in Beijing and gain the support of more Chinese reformers on our side. However, even if confronted with a global coalition, China will not reply back to lofty pronouncements about international norms. Such rhetoric must be backed up by substantial military and economic power. The repeal of Trump's Phase 1 tariffs on China is currently being pushed by a number of US businesses, without asking China to overturn any of the subsidies that prompted the tariffs in the very first place. This is a bad idea. When trying to deal with China, use gentle language but always levy a substantial tariff and an aircraft carrier. After a 20-year war on terrorism, Mosa Visade argues that our priority should be repaired at home, which includes addressing yawning deficits in educational facilities, infrastructures, incomes and racial equity. If we believe that our primary concern should be repaired at home, he asks whether it is more useful or even more dangerous to emphasize the China threat. It has the potential to ignite a fire under Americans to take a more serious approach to national renewal. In addition, it has the potential to ignite the entire United States-China relationship, impacting everything from supply chain operation to student exchanges to Chinese purchases of United States government bonds. However, this would definitely take the focus away from the war on terrorism and towards the war on China, which is something we should completely avoid, so that in the coming years we can hope to see a more healthy relationship between the two countries. What do you think about this? Let us know down in the comment section below. Well, thank yourself for making it to the end. If you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you want to see more content like this one, consider turning the post notification on so that you get notified every time we upload a new video. Thanks for watching guys and with that said, I'll see you in the next video.